ahead and we'll get started. Welcome back to another lecture. I uh, just want to remind you that uh, after class at 2 o'clock, uh, the first quiz will become available on Canvas. Now, for that quiz, you want to make sure before you take it, there's a video that I sent out through an announcement. Let me make sure you watch that video first. So uh, nothing you got to do right away. The quiz will be available from uh, 2 o'clock today until uh, midnight on Sunday. So you can take it any time between that time. You want to make sure you watch the, the, uh, the video first. Um, you'll have plenty of time to do, to do the quiz. You'll watch the video, and then um, in the quiz, I'll ask you some questions from the video. So you want to watch the video you know, pretty closely um, and uh, jot down some notes and, and have your notes available when you, uh, when you take the quiz. So it should be pretty, pretty simple. Watch the video then sometime between uh, 2 o'clock today and midnight on Sunday. Just kind of relax after you watch the video, take the quiz, and uh, I'm sure everybody will do well. So uh, with that, let's get started. I want to just kind of go back because I kind of got off topic just a little bit uh, in the last class, but it was interesting. So I want to review the uh, four main points I was trying to get across to make sure we're clear on them. And then we'll move on with the topic of the day. If you haven't sent a text to the number on the board, please go ahead and do that right now. Text me at 513-494-6162. Uh, in the body of the text, write logic control, and make sure you put your first and last name. And go ahead and do that right now. And I'll use that for attendance for today. So in the last class was a big topic. Uh, we talked about the difference between analog and digital. And uh, specifically, as applies to uh, digital devices, we use the term analog. We mean analog signals. And digital, we, we mean digital signals. But just kind of a wider meaning, analog means continuous. Digital means discrete. So if we think about analog quantities, and we think about natural quantities that we will measure, quantities that we will measure in nature, most of the things that you'll measure, like time or temperature, force or pressure, those are continuous quantities, meaning that you don't go from one temperature and, uh, to another. You kind, of, you kind of move through a gradient, and it's continuous. So if you have a sensor that creates a voltage from a change in temperature, then that voltage or signal that's produced Will be a continuous one that is it will be an analog one and so i showed you uh, a diagram we looked at this uh this picture and if you go ahead and zoom in on that we looked at these two signals and we compared them analog is pretty easy to define because any kind of signal you draw where if uh, you're going to make a graph and represent the signal the voltage you wouldn't lift up your pen or pencil until you got to the end of the the, the graph um, that signal was continuous. So at the top here, we see that we have a continuous signal. And so this is an analog signal. Over time, the signal is continuous. But if I want to digitize it, now to understand what we mean by digital or digitizing, that's a little bit more complicated. It's, um, it's a process. So if I want to change this top signal into a digital signal, the process I go through is this. We go through and we have to sample this analog signal at certain points. And so down here, they show you on a, a PNC uh, encoded signal, the graph. Um, they show that we take a data point here, we took the sample here, we take these samples at regular intervals, and the rate at which we take those samples is called the sampling rate. Um, the number of samples I have in the given amount of time is called the resolution. The more samples I take in a given amount of time, the higher the quality of the digital signal I'll get. But then we mentioned in the last class that there's a trade-off. The more points I take, two things we have to concern ourselves with. Number one, in order to actually digitize a signal, what we do is we store each of these data points as a code. So over here on the left, you see these zeros and ones. Well, that represents the digital code that we're going to use to store a certain point, say this one. And so the actual digitizing of a signal means we're going to take sample a analog signal. We're going to take that particular point. We're going to store it 
using a, a, a group of zeros or ones. And zeros or ones represent either a binary number or a binary call. So what do we mean by binary? Well, binary is just a, a, a number system we use to represent the presence or absence of a signal. If a signal is present, we say we're gonna represent that state of being present with the binary one. If a signal is not present, we're gonna represent that state with the binary, with the zero. So we can, we can represent ones and zeros, but physically it's the presence or absence of a voltage, and I'll get into that in just a second. So uh, again, the process of digitizing, we, we sample, and the more samples we take, the more codes I'm gonna need. So there was a trade-off between the amount of uh, digital data I wanna store and move around. And uh, the trade-off is that the more points I have, the more codes I'm gonna need to store those points. So I need more room. And then secondly, we don't just store, we don't just uh, digitize for the uh, sake of digitizing. We usually have to move those zeros and ones around. So we have to transfer that data from one place to another either inside the digital machine or outside the digital machine, which means the more zeros and ones I have to, to move back and forth, the longer that's going to take. So resolution depends as a trade-off between the amount of data and the time it takes a trade-off to, 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 uh, to, to, to transfer that data to move it around. And so we also uh, mentioned the fact that uh, there's this advantage to doing things digitally. Well, uh, there's a lot of cases where I can, I have a choice. I can have an analog signal, I can have a digital signal, and I can use either or, but there's a certain advantage that digital has over analog, and we call this the digital advantage. And we talked about the two main parts of that idea that with digital, I can keep making copies over and over and over again, and the, each copy is exactly like the one I started from, which we call the master. So whether you're talking about pictures that's been digitized, uh, movies has been digitized. Uh, no matter what it is, you can keep making copies of a copy of a copy. And since we're using numbers to represent data points, that those numbers can be repeated as often as necessary. And the original and the uh, copy, the nth generation, will be exactly the same so long as you don't lose any of those zeros or ones. So the digital advantage, I can keep making copies. And the second part of that is I can reduce, I can, I can, I can compress this this information, um, and I can make, I can, I can store it. And uh, I, I think I used the example of a cassette tape, which is analog, and your uh, thumb drive. You can actually store thousands, and in some cases even millions of, of songs or pieces of digital information on a device like a, a thumb drive. And so we talked about the digital advantage. We asked the question, what is a computer? Somebody said, well, a computer can take in data, it can process that data, and it can output information. So in order to qualify to be a computer, it has to be able to do those three things. Take in data, process it some kind of way, do something to it, and spit out information. And so I said that we're going to think of in this class anything that contains a, a microprocessor, which is basically a tiny computer itself, Anything that contains a microprocessor, anything we talk about in this class applies to that device. A computer really is anything that contains a microprocessor. The point is, it's not just the laptop you might have in front of you. It's not just the, uh, the desktop you might have in front, of it, in front of you. Your cell phone has a microprocessor in it, therefore your cell phone is a computer. Your refrigerator, your microwave, any device like that that you can program is really a computer and your car, if you have a late model car, probably has several computers in it. So after this class, I want you to think of a computer in a totally different way than you might have previously thought about as just being a laptop or a desktop. A computer is anything that contains a microprocessor. When we talked about how these uh, zeros and ones, how are they actually stored? What do they actually look like? And I don't think I showed this uh, graph on the, the board uh, yesterday, but uh, I, I think I drew it. And so here you see that we have, uh, and, and again, these numbers here, you can, these numbers here are not set in stone, but what we have here is a, a signal here. It says that a high, and I'm using the term high 
The term high, think of that as a one. And the term low, we mean a zero. So what this first graph is showing is that between, um, well, we know I mentioned in the last class that if you think about it, we typically use five volts to represent a binary one and zero volts to represent a, a, a zero, a binary zero. Now, those are ideal values. In the perfect world, exactly five volts would represent a one and exactly zero volts would represent a binary zero. But in reality, in practical devices, you have this range, and that's kind of what this diagram is showing you. So uh, what this first diagram is saying that even though we know that 5 volts represents a 1, really anywhere between 2 volts up to 5 volts, your circuitry will interpret that as a binary 1. And anywhere between 0 volts and 0.8 volts for this particular technology, your, uh, your circuitry will interpret that as a binary 0. So you don't have this exact value for 5 and exact value for 0, although that's what we'll use. In this class, we'll, we'll use ideal values, but in reality, you have this range. Now, you might think to yourself, well, what if, what if you're right here between these two ranges? Well, if you're between 0.8 and 2 volts, what, what would that look like to a computer or some kind of digital device? Well, that region between uh, the, uh, the maximum uh, low value and the minimum high value, that region between those two values, in this case, the 0.8 and the 2 volts, that's called the forbidden zone. And if, if, if your signal, they have circuitry to protect to make sure you don't fall there. But if for some reason your signal did fall, in this case between 0.8 and 2 volts, then your output, your, your results would be unpredictable. And so they usually have circuitry to protect against that. So this idea of binary, binary is a way of representing the presence or absence of a voltage. We'll use a binary one to represent the presence of a signal and a binary zero to represent the absence of a signal. And typically, five volts and uh, zero volts is what's used. And when you use those zeros and ones, that binary, the term they use for that is machine language. So we call that machine language. So any, any digital device, no matter what you put into it, that, that information has to be changed to zeros and ones because that particular device, that particular machine, only speaks in zeros and ones. It only speaks in machine language. So what that means is when you take a picture, when you take a picture, um, that picture, if it's, a, if it's an analog information going into your camera, when you take that picture, it has to be converted to zeros or ones. If you're speaking into the microphone of your cell phone or computer, that analog signal has to, has to, has to change over to zeros and ones. Anything that goes into a digital device, a microprocessor, is changed to zeros and ones. Now, somebody sent a message up, and I called just the part of that. Let me go and see what they said for the message. Uh, it says, why do you have a forbidden zone? Well, somebody asked the question, why, why do you have a, a, a forbidden zone? And so remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, change a continuous signal into a discrete signal. We're trying to change analog to digital. And to do that, what we want to do is represent data as zeros or ones. So in a, in a perfect world, I can say, all right, I can take any two voltages, any two I want. We just so happen we choose 5 volts and 0 volts. I can say I'm going to let 5 volts stand for 1, a binary 1, and 0 volts stand for a binary zero. So in the perfect world, exactly five volts is a one, exactly zero volts is a zero. And then once I do that, I don't know if you guys have the circuits course, but once you do that, once you once you equate a voltage amplitude to a number, well, you can do a whole bunch of stuff with this. For instance, if you're in the circuits course and you study the device called a capacitor, you might know that the capacitor is used to store a whole electrical charge or energy. And so what they used to do a long time ago, and actually kind of still do it, they had these microscopic capacitors. They might take a group of capacitors and put them together. And a capacitor, the symbol for capacitors like this. And that's a device that you can actually, you can charge it up and it'll hold five volts, kind of like a battery. So I might have capacitors, a couple capacitors just kind of sitting next to each other like that. 
And this one, maybe I would charge that up to five volts. So this one has five volts on it. And maybe I charge that one up to five volts with the circuit. And maybe these one, then the next two, I don't charge this one up and I don't charge that one up. Well, if you apply this thinking to it, I'm going to let five volts equal one, zero volts equal zero. And really what you store is this code, this, this binary code, one, one, zero, zero. And so remember, understand that physically in the machine, any electrical circuit knows nothing about zeros and ones. It only understands the presence or absence of a voltage. And so when we talk about a one, that means somewhere in that machine, somewhere in that device, there's five volts present. When we talk about a binary zero in that machine in a particular location, there's zero volts present. And I'm just showing you here, you can use capacitors to do that to actually store digital information. But somebody said, well, why, well, why do we have a forbidden zone? It's because it's impossible to have exactly five volts, right? So typically, well, actually that's a, for a couple of reasons. It's, it's, it's impossible to have exactly five volts, exactly anything. You know that from engineering. So really you gotta have a range. The other reason is you kind of want a forbidden zone. You want that range. You don't want it to be exactly five volts or exactly zero volts. It's because typically any kind of device, any kind of electrical device, if you start hooking things together like this, cascading them, say these are electrical devices, and uh, say you have a certain amount of voltage coming here, well, when, it, when, that, when that current of voltage flows through this device, whatever it is, it's going to be reduced a little bit. And I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating here, but maybe this right here drops down to four volts. You're going to lose some energy in this device. So if you start daisy chaining, daisy chaining these together, every time a signal passes through something, some of that signal is going to be lost. So if we had exactly five volts, if we could do that, if we have exactly five volts representing one, do you see the problem we will have here? On this other side, I have four volts. Now, you're not really going to drop a whole volt. So again, I'm exa exa exaggerating, but you really, really kind of want that, that spread. You want that spread. So instead of having exactly five volts representing one, you get that range like, was in, like I showed you in the graph. So you have five volts, and then I think they had like two volts here. So this whole area here, Anywhere in that zone in there, the circuitry will read that as a one. And then down here, I think it has something like 0.8 and zero. So any, anywhere in this zone is interpreted as a zero, binary zero. And you don't want anything in here. You want that separation in here. So you can clearly see I have a one or clearly see I have a zero. So you kind of need that, that padding built in there between those two. So that's how information is stored stored as the presence or absence of a voltage, but we abstract from that as humans and we think about it in terms of zeros or ones. And we'll, we won't go back to this level again of the voltage. Even though physically we know we're storing a voltage or not storing a voltage represent a zero or one, you won't hear me talk about that again. We'll just, we'll just refer to this. We refer to that as binary or machine language. And one piece of that information is called a bit, a bit. So you'll hear me talk about that. I won't go to the voltage again. Uh, let's see. Okay, I guess you guys are talking to each other. All right, so let me get into the what I want to talk about today. So what I want to talk about today is we kind of um, – Okay, you understand that we, we live in an analog world. We live in an analog world, but when I want to put information into a, a digital machine, like, a, oh, here's my lights again. Sorry, guys. I'll try to fix that next time. You guys can't see it, but this, this room is kind of, Kind of the room is kind of shaped like this, kind of shaped like this, and I'm over here, and the motion detector's over here. It can't pick me up, so it keeps turning the lights out, and when I move out like that, it doesn't pick me up. So I'll try to, I'll try to adjust that. But so um, all we live, we live in an analog world, 
but the, the tools that we use nowadays, computers, cell phones, anything that you can program, anything that contains a microprocessor, those are all digital. So if I want a computer or a, or a PLC, if I want that to interact with the physical world, I have to, I have to take the analog quantities and change it to something that the computer can understand. I have to change it to, to zero, to zeros and ones or machine language. Well, once we get a value as a zero or a one, what do we do with it? Typically, you got to move it around somewhere. If you think about it, um, well, just think about making a, a call on your cell phone. You make a call on your cell phone, um, the information goes into the microphone, it digitizes it, and then it's got that data, those zeros or ones have to move around inside your phone. Or if you have a computer network, maybe you have a hardwired network where you have, or even a wireless network, where you have a computer, and on the other side of the room you have a printer, you type something up on your computer, you hit the, the print button, and you send it over to the printer, you're moving bits. You're moving bits in groups called bytes. So you got to transfer that information. You got to move it around. So it's one thing to charge up a capacitor to five volts and let that represent a one, or not charge it up and let that lack of a voltage represent a zero. But once you get those ones and zeros stored, how do you move them around? How do you how do you transfer them from one place to another? And that's called data transfer. So to understand that, the first thing we want to look at is something called a digital pulse. So let me share this document with you right here. Now you zoom in on that, there's a magnifier up in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. And you can see the digital pulse. So if you look at figure 1-6, they're showing you an example of two types of what they call ideal pulses. There's an ideal pulse, and at the bottom of the page, I'll show you in just a few minutes, there's a non-ideal pulse. Now in here, I'll show you the, uh, I'll show you the non-ideal, but we'll always deal with ideal quantities in here. So again, we know we have that range in the forbidden zone when representing uh, ones and zeros, but we'll always say exactly five volts is a one, and exactly zero volts is a zero. And here we deal with digital pulses, these pulses, mm -hmm. Even though we know they don't exactly look like this, we're going to um, we're going to assume that we have perfect uh, perfect waveforms or perfect pulses. So uh, somebody just asked. I saw a uh, somebody asked about the forbidden zone. So again, the forbidden zone is. Let me go back to the camera one more time. So the forbidden zone is. is just this. In a perfect world, when we digitize something, we use what we call two-state electronics. That means that we're going to use two levels of voltage. It could be any, anything you want. You can use 10 volts and 3 volts if you want. You can use 5 volts and 2 volts. For whatever reason, they decided to use 5 volts and 0 volts. 5 and 0. And they say, all right, we're going we're gonna, to uh, represent a value we call binary 1 if I see 5 volts, and the value we call a binary 0 if I see no volts. So in the perfect world, that graph would be drawn like this. 5 volts, 0 volts. And exactly at this point right here, that would, that would represent a binary 1, and this would be a 0. Well, what the graph was showing you is that in reality you don't have exactly five volts represented by one or exactly zero volts representation of uh, representing a zero. What you really have is a range. So it looks more like this. Maybe from here down to here, and I think it doesn't really matter. I think they had two volts, but this whole area here. If my voltage is anywhere between two volts and five volts, that's interpreted by the circuitry as a 1. And down here, according to the graph I just showed you, down here, the, uh, the maximum voltage to see what they call a low, it was 0.8 volts, and the minimum was 0 volts. So we're down here in this range, if your, circuitry, if your circuitry sees a voltage between 0 and 0 
it's going to interpret that as a zero. So with two-state electronics, you only want you only want to have a one or a zero. You only want to have a five or or zero volts. So there got there's got to be some padding between there, and that's what that forbidden zone is. So you want really the wider that is. I mean, it's kind of a trade-off. The wider that is, in some cases, the better. But then you got that thing about every time you connect another a digital device, the output of, a, of one device to another, you're going to lose a little bit of, of voltage. But to answer your question. The forbidden zone is just the, the part where if you have di a digital circuit where you're not supposed to operate a voltage. You don't want to be between 0.8 or 2 volts because if you're in here in that forbidden zone, the circuit, you can't tell if you have a 1 or a 0. You need that padding in between there. So that is the forbidden zone. But again, you really don't have to worry about that. I'm just showing you because this is school and you, you, know, you want to be, quote, unquote, educated. We're going to think about it this way. Even though we know... In reality, we're dealing with this. We'll use ideal values all the time. We'll use ideal. And so even on the picture I was showing you before, the graph of the waveform, um, let me find it, of the pulse, these are examples of digital pulses. So think about how this pulse is created. Now go ahead and zoom in on that. See, blow that up real big. And then look at the way this pulse is created. First of all, look at what they call a positive going pulse. So what, how do we get that? Now, when you see this word right here, high, you can either think that that's a one, a binary one, or that's five volts. This is five volts. And when you see the term low, think of a binary zero, but remember that's zero volts. So if I want to create this, this pulse right here, and remember, if I think about this on the graph, then time is always on the horizontal axis. All I have to do to create that square wave, that square pulse, is I start out at zero volts. I increase to five volts. I leave it at five volts for a certain amount of time over to here. And then I drop back down to zero volts. That represents what we call positive going pulse. If I want to create a negative going pulse, which is going to represent a zero, I start out at five volts right here. I go down to zero volts. I stay at zero volts for a certain amount of time. And at this point right here, I go back up to five volts. So if I start out at zero, go up to five, stay at five for a certain amount of time, go then drop back to zero, that's a positive going pulse. If I start out high, if I start out at five, then drop down to zero, stay at zero volts for a certain amount of time, then go back up to five, that's a negative going pulse. Now the problem with the graph that I'm showing you is, well, you tell me the problem. What is the problem right here? Think of time right here, and this is my amplitude right here. And if this right here is time t equals zero, that's our starting time. How much time, according to this graph, does it take to go from zero volts up to five volts? Zero time. Yeah, and we know that's impossible, right? You can't change from zero to five volts or from zero to any other voltage uh, 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 amplitude in no time. You can't do it instantaneously. So at the very bottom, they're showing you what an actual pulse looks like. So if you actually looked at this, on a device that will display digital pulses, like a digital oscilloscope, this is what you would see. You wouldn't see a perfect square wave, a square pulse like we show at the top. You see more like this, and then you can see that correctly, it takes a certain amount of time to go up to our five volt level. We stay at that time for a certain amount of time. And then again, it takes a certain amount of time to drop back down to a zero volt level. So if you look at the little subscripts there, the T's there stand for time. So this right here, T sub R, that's called your rise time, and that little T sub F is your fall time. And so notice they measure that when they measure, say, the rise time, for example. They don't start right here at what they call the baseline. They go up 10% from the baseline, and then they start to measure that T rise. And when they measure the maximum part of the rise time, they don't do it at the top where the amplitude is flat. They, they go 90% below that maximum value of the amplitude. 
they go 90%. And the reason they do that is because if you think about it, look at the graph carefully, like right in here, that's nonlinear. And right here where the curve is kind of doesn't have that edge on it, that's also nonlinear. And so what they do, they want to, to, to measure that rise time and fall time in the linear portion of this, this little waveform. So if you go 10% above the baseline and 10% below the maximum amplitude, then you're in what we call the linear region. So somebody just asked a good question. Let me get back to that in a second. I think they said about, let me go to that. Uh, let's see. With the uh, POC read for the positive going. Okay, so, um, well, you're getting a little bit ahead. So this, um, the whole idea of pulses, let me just kind of back up a little bit because somebody asked a good question. So what we can do, we can easily, real easy, we can store a zero or one. I mean, physically, we can go get four capacitors, like I said before. Say I want to make a, a circuit, I mean a big circuit, to store to store voltage. I can go get some capacitors. Let me see if I have a capacitor laying around. I don't. Usually there's one laying. I'm in an electronic shop, and usually there's a capacitor laying around. But you can literally go buy, go buy some capacitors. And this is not the way it's done, but if you wanted to, you could do it. You can have you can have four capacitors, like I said before. Now, usually they don't group things in fours, they group them in eights, but we'll talk about that another time. But let's just say you get four capacitors, like I said before, and you charge this one up right here to have five volts on it. You charge this one up right here to have zero volts on it, and you charge these two up to five volts and five volts. What you stored there is this, this binary code or number. This is a one, this is a zero, this is a one, and that's a one. So the machine sees this, we think about it like this. So I've stored, I've actually stored some digital information. I really should say data. Data is kind of like raw facts. Information is data that's been processed. So each one of these bits is a piece of digital data. It might be part of, when you press the, the letter A on your keyboard or anything on your keyboard, and it's not stored in groups of fours. They actually use groups of eight. But you store any key press as a group of eight bits called a byte. But once you store them, so what do you do with them? I mean, you can't just leave them in memory. Or if they're in these capacitors and they're holding these zeros at once, that doesn't do me any good. I got to move these things around. When I process anything, this is going to move from in your PLC or computer or cell phone, you have memory. Maybe you have, uh, oh, here's a perfect example. When you turn your computer on, it has to boot up. What exactly does that mean when your computer is booting up? Well, your computer uses something called an operating system. So it has to actually load up the operating system. Now, you got to remember, I don't care if it's a picture, sound, video, it doesn't matter. Anything that goes into that computer, cell phone, or digital device is stored as zeros and ones, including the operating system. So when you turn your laptop on and it's booting up, takes a minute before it comes on, it's booting up, it's actually moving the operating system from the hard drive up to what we call RAM. RAM, we'll get into this later, but that stands for random access memory. We'll just call it memory for now. You can't do anything until your, oper until your operating system goes from the hard drive up to RAM. But what do I mean when I say goes from the hard drive to RAM? Really what you're doing is you're moving that whole operating system is written in zeros and ones, machine language. And so all those zeros and ones have to be moved from the hard drive up the memory before you can use your, I'm using a, I'm using a uh, computer as an example, but even when you turn your cell phone on, you're booting your cell phone on, up. And there's, there's, there's actually a little tiny, it's not a, like a, a hard drive, but there's a similar device that stores the operating system for your cell phone. You gotta move those zeros and ones from one place to another. So it's one thing to use like capacitors, or we can do this magnetically. Um, there's a lot of ways to store zeros and ones, but what we want to speak to now is how do I move those zeros and ones either from, maybe from the memory to, uh, to the microprocessor or from, uh, from a computer to a printer. How do I move those bits around? 
So we're getting into uh, into that with these waveforms. And so, since I got the camera off, I got to be able to, let me go back to that call. So if I have a 1101 and I want to move this, I want to move this around, how do I do it? How do I move it from memory to the microprocessor? Well, you got to do it one bit at a time. But remember, even though that's a one, it's really five volts of electricity. It's really not correct for you to say it, say it that way. But that's five volts of electricity, quote unquote. This is five volts. This is zero volts. How do I move that? Well, to move it, this is dynamic to make it static. Oh, I'm saying I said it wrong. This is this is uh, static to make it dynamic to move it around. I got it, this idea of a pulse comes in where I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna create this pulse by by doing this. I'm gonna have a voltage. This is time. It's this amplitude. I'm going to have a voltage that starts out at zero volts. It's going to go up to five volts. It's going to stay at five volts for a certain amount of time and then drop back down to zero volts. That's the first step to understanding how we're going to move these bits around. Now, we haven't moved anything yet. Before we talk about that, we got to talk about how do I create a pulse? And that's what this picture is showing you. But I just wanted to bring out the fact that, as somebody correctly said, this is an ideal pulse because there's no way to go from zero volts to five volts right away instantaneously. It really ramps up like that. And you stay at five volts for a certain amount of time, and then it ramps back down like that. So in this class, just to keep it easy, we deal with the ideal. We don't have to, but I'm just showing you that in reality, if you say it, Maybe you go to graduate school and get into this stuff. I mean, the details of it. This is what a pulse actually looks like, or more like what they had in the diagram. So I don't want to spend too much time on this, because this really isn't. I just kind of want to show you what's going on. But this um, this really isn't too important for understanding. I forgot about this picture. So here is, not to jump around, but here's a system. Uh, this is a complete analog uh, system here where I have these original sound waves. You know that that is analog. Notice I have continuous signal here that's analog. I have what they call a linear amplifier. That just means the, the input and output are proportional. But I get an analog signal out, but it's larger. That's what an amplifier does. It increases the amplitude and the power of the signal. And so this sound over here that was small, now it comes out over here, it's a lot louder. But this is a complete, a completely analog system, where if I go down to here, maybe I have something recorded on a, on a CD. So I know this right here, all of this is stored as zeros and ones. And so when I play my, my either my DVD or my CD, those zeros and ones come off. And I notice how they, and this is actually a perfect example. Look at this, that they have these pulses here. This is what I'm talking about pulses because we got to move those bits from this CD, which are static, into this into this circuitry over here. And so to do that, we do that with, with these pulses or a bunch of pulses together, which if I don't run out of time, I'm going to get to that in just a second. But in this system, we have a uh, we got a couple things going on. Our information is all digital. I'm going to move it from the CD into this device right here. This is called a digital to analog converter. They call it the DAC for short, a DAC, digital to analog converter. And so we're taking digital information, we're converting it to analog. Why do we do that? Well, because our amplifier can only understand analog. So I got to convert it over to analog. I got to rebuild that analog signal. So here's a, a, a uh, I don't know if you want to call it a system, but here's a, a system that uses both. We start out here in uh, digital or binary, and we convert it over to an analog signal. So that was, I skipped over that. That was just a uh, an example. But let me go back to my, where's my digital pulse? I got so many files here. So again, um, just wanted to show you that uh, none of this happens instantaneously. And then you can read about this. This is up on your canvas. I don't want to spend too much time here because really what we want to do is we want to put these pulses together. 
we want to do this. Let me, we want to, where is it? We want to do this. We want to start putting these pulses together like that. So what happens is when you put pulses together, you get what's called a pulse train or a, some people say just, they just call it a waveform, a pulse train or just a, a, a waveform, a digital waveform. And notice we have, we actually have a couple types of waveforms here. So let me talk about these waveforms. So any kind of waveform, you guys probably talked about a waveform called a, a sine wave or a cosine wave. There's two types of waves we can talk about. And both are important to what we want to do in this class. So there's two kind of waveforms. The first type is called periodic. The second type is non-periodic. And quite simply put, periodic means it repeats at a regular interval. Non-periodic means it doesn't repeat. If I have a periodic waveform and it repeats at a regular interval, then that means it has something called a frequency. And the frequency is just how often it repeats. So what I can do is, if I wanted to, I can take this digital pulse, and if I keep making that pulse over and over again, here's what I would have. And it'll just keep going on like that forever. So this is called a pulse train or just a waveform. But if you think about it, if you think about it as starting right here, say it starts right here, it goes up to five volts, it stays there, it drops back down, zero volts and it stays at zero for a certain amount of time. This is the part right here that repeats. So there's one cycle of the waveform and then there's another one where it starts to repeat. So this represents one we'll call the cycle, one cycle of the waveform. So how many of those you get in one second is called the frequency. Now you've heard the term frequency before but you, you might not know what it meant you might have a, a frequency of, let's say, a thousand, and the unit they use is the hertz, HZ. Well, hertz, one hertz is just one cycle. So if I have one one of these, one of these every second, my frequency is one hertz, which is pretty slow. If I have a thousand hertz, I get a thousand of these things in one second. It repeats every a thousand of those in, in, a, in a space time of one second. So the idea of a periodic waveform means it has a frequency, it's a number of cycles in a given second, and it also has a period, which is the time for one of these, the T-I-M-E, the time for one of those. And that's pretty important. There's a relationship. We use a script F for frequency. We use this capital T right here for period. So the relationship is the frequency is 1 over the period and vice versa. Okay, so you can calculate one given the other. So you can go back to the diagram that I was showing you, and you'll notice something, that we actually have a couple types of waveforms. We have the one at the very top, this one. Notice how it repeats at regular intervals. So this is actually a periodic waveform. And the ones below it are non-periodic waveform, which means they don't have a regular frequency or regular period. That's all that means. But in the bigger picture, what it really means is, the way we really use this is, the part right here that's periodic is called a clock. I'm going to just abbreviate it CLK. And sorry about my, my writing here on this whiteboard. Every digital device that moves data, data around, and is going to move data around if it contains a, a microprocessor, because it's got to move zeros and ones in and out of memory, 
uh, back and forth to the hard drive. It's got to process that data. So every digital device has a clock in it. Not a physical clock like, like you hang it on the wall or your watch, but it's just a circuit that creates a pulse train like the one I'm showing you in this diagram. When you talk about the speed of the computer, you buy a computer and they say it's uh, my, my, my computer is 500 gigahertz. What are they talking about? They mean a lot of things, but the main thing is they're talking about the speed of the clock. How fast can you clock that computer? And so it turns out that everything happens when the clock changes. Nothing happens until the clock changes. So from this diagram, here's what I want you to understand. Every digital device has a clock, so it's going to create a signal or waveform like the one I've circled on, on, the, on the top here. What you see below is data. This is the data down here that you want to transfer from one place to another. Now, let me go back to the camera and let me be a little bit more clear on that. Let's say uh, I go back to the example when I had those capacitors. And I say, well, that's static information. We're just holding, the, we're, we're basically storing zeros and ones. We're storing the information or the data. So if I have uh, maybe uh, one, one, zero, one, and I want to move this, well, what I'm going to do is for that one, I'm going to create a pulse. And for that one, I'm going to create a pulse. When I have a positive going pulse right there, that's going to represent a one that's moving. And when I have a negative going pulse like this, that's going to represent a zero that's moving. So the problem is, though, is let's say I have I have two ones together like that. How do I? If I have a waveform like this, right? I mean, clearly, clearly that right there is a zero. But how many ones is this? I mean, how do I know? How do I know? Is that two ones? Is that how do I know how many ones I'm sending or how many zeros I'm sending? How do I know that? Well, the way you know that is, is by doing this. If you look at your clock and you go back to what I said before, right where this clock starts to repeat. So from here to this point over here is where it starts to repeat. That represents something called the bit time, the bit time. So I'm going to switch back to the camera again so you can watch what I'm doing. So every digital device, no matter what, if it has a microprocessor, then built into that microprocessor, it has a clocking circuit. And it's going to produce a, a signal that's continuous like this. It's periodic. If it's periodic, that means it has a frequency. If it has a frequency, that means I can use this equation right here to get the period. And the period is actually the time for one cycle. The period is the time for one cycle. And the time for one cycle, the period, time for one cycle, we call that the bit time. Oh, gosh. Sorry, guys. This is almost comical, I know. You got to do something about that. Okay, so we use the bit time to determine how many bits we're moving around from one place to another. So the... <laughs> yeah, I might have to try that. So here's what we'll do. What we do is we figure out, they, you got to be given something. So what we'll do, you can easily get the frequency. I'll, you know the frequency of your computer probably when you bought it. But you start out with the frequency. You use this, this formula right here, this equation to get the bit time. And now you know the time. The bit time is really literally the time for one bit. So all you got to do to figure out graphically the bit time is, one cycle starts to repeat right here. If I drop down a line like that and a line like that, each one of these represents, that's a one, that's a one kind of in series. Now I don't have it drawn here, you know, perfectly, but let me go back to the 
the diagram and you can see it a little bit more clearly. Zoom in on this, and now you can see what I'm talking about, I hope, that these numbers, this number one, two, these are the bit times. So right here, for example, you can clearly see in, in this signal they have label A, that's a one, now that's a one, this is a zero. But down here, because we got the bit time defined, you know that right here, this is a zero, but because we got the bit time defined, you know this is a one, and this is a one kind of right next to each other. And over here, this is a zero, and this is a zero right next to each other. So how would you, how would you get to that? So what you got to, there's actually a, 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 we have time, but I don't run out of time. This is an example we'll do. Given the frequency of the clock, you use that equation, period is one over frequency to figure out the bit time. And you can find out how much time it takes to move this data around. Okay, but let me go back to the camera. There's, <laughs> I know it gets complicated. There's two ways we can move data. We can move data like this. So I got the, uh, that one, zero, one, one. And I want to move those bits somewhere. But remember, these are really pulses I'm actually moving that move up and down the wire. But I can move this. That, well, you got to have something to move it to. Where am I going to put it? Well, the thing that holds bits is called a register. A register. And just think of it as uh, like a bunch of boxes or cells. And each cell can hold either 0 or 1. And so you can put zeros or 1s in, and it'll hold. It'll just store them. This is actually a physical device that you can go to a store and buy a register if you want. If you're into this stuff, you can buy this. And it will store zeros and ones. But when you talk about registers, there's different ways to get the bits in and out of the register. For example, like this right here, I can actually, I got a nice example here. Let me show you this. This is a little better to look at. So look at this. So the idea here is uh, this is a register. This whole thing is a register. And you can never have an empty cell. It's always got to have something in it. And the thing it's going to have in it is a, a zero or one. In digital, you can't not have a value. You got to have something. Either it's a one or a zero. If you put it there, uh, then it's a one or a zero. If you didn't put it there, it's still a one or a zero. But we call that garbage. I mean, literally, we call it garbage. So here we started out with initially all the registers, they have zeros in it. And what I want to do is I want to, I want this binary number, this binary, this group of bits, I want to put, I want to store those in this register. That's what a register does is it stores bits. So the first thing that's going to happen is that you got to remember nothing happens until the clock changes. Everything happens, happens when that during the period of a clock, when it shifts, or we'll say it clicks. So then the first click on the clock, this one right here will move into the shift register, and this is what this is showing right here. And then the next click of the clock, this zero right here is going to move into the register. And then the next click of the clock, this one right here is going to move into the register. Now notice every time I move a bit in, the next one moves over. It's going to take exactly for this particular number, it's going to take exactly four clock cycles to get this to store this number 0, 1, 0, 1. And after the four clock cycle, it's, it's in the register like that. Okay? Now, I'm probably going to run out of time, but let me, that's important because, back on the camera now, if I want to, if I want to get these zeros and ones into the register, I can do it like the example I just showed you, bit by bit. And maybe, maybe I do this. I got a line coming in like this, and I want to put this number in there bit by bit. So this one will go in, and it'll click. This one will move over, and the next one, it'll, it'll four clicks of the clock. But there's no reason why I can't have a shift register set up like this, where I have one line in, and I got four lines out. 
So to get this number, if I have a four bit number, so I have one, one, zero, one. It'll take four clock pulses to get that in here. And after the fourth clock pulse, the one that's, this is loaded, but these are my output lines right here. It only takes one click of the clock to get it out, to get the information out, or to read it. This is what we call a read. We're writing into uh, the register, we're reading out of it. So it takes four clock pulses to get the information in, but only one to get out, for it to come out. This is called a serial win parallel out. Maybe I don't have those four lines. Maybe I just got one line like that. So now it takes four clock pulses to write to this register, to, to put the ones and zeros into it. If I want to read it, it's going to take four clock pulses for me to get it out. And so you can configure this all different kind of ways. I mean, I can have this, where I have four lines coming in, and I have four lines coming out. If I have a binary number, 0, 1, 0, 1, and one clock pulse, this will load up, and in one clock pulse, I can read it. You might say, well, that seems a lot faster. Why not do it this way? Well, that, like everything in engineering, there's a trade-off. The trade-off is if I have, let's say, the slowest is serial in, serial out. I have a shift register. One line in, one line out. It's slow, but it's less complicated and it's very inexpensive. The fastest way is to have parallel in, parallel out. It's really fast, but look at this. I have eight lines, total eight lines, and it's way more complicated. It's going to take a lot to make this system. So like anything, there's a trade-off. Now let me go back to this picture because they show you a perfect example of parallel uh, data transfer when... When you're talking, when your computer is talking to the printer, in the old days, they said you have a serial line. Well, a serial line because there was a line, one physical line between the, the computer and the printer, and you actually would send, let's say you have a Word document type. Now, even though you type in A, B, C, D, you type, you type in the alphabet, remember what goes into the computer is zeros or ones. No matter what, it's zeros and ones that you're moving around. Well, it used to be that when you when your PC talked to a printer, it did so. It sent it. It will send it out bit by bit. So it would take a, a, a relatively long time for your for your the memory of your printer to, to be loaded with all the zeros and ones from your Word document. But it doesn't really need to be fast. So it's a lot less it's a lot less inexpensive to send that information in a serial fashion. Whereas this other diagram is showing you. Parallel data transfer. So you have uh, over here, you can't see it, but this is the microprocessor. This is inside your cell phone, inside your computer. And over here is memory. Well, if you did it like this, you never get anything done. When the microprocessor is talking to memory or vice versa, things got to happen really, really fast. So inside of your PC or your cell phone, you're not going to find you're not going to find serial in, serial out circuits. You're going to find something like this. And that's typically how it's done. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. I usually get through all this information. I think we're okay, though, because the quiz isn't, the quiz you're going to take on uh, after after 2 o'clock today is not based on anything I talked about. So I'll have to, I'll have to finish this up on um on Monday, but let me just say this, guys, before I sign off. There is, if it's confusing, I think it'll be crystal clear after we do this. This is what I'll start off Monday with. We'll, we'll think, I'll review slightly what we talked about, but you want to understand these two problems, and if you do, that's pretty much it for week one as far as the, the topic of data transfer. So if you're a little bit confused, it's okay. I think on Monday when I go over this problem, it'll be crystal clear. Uh, other than that, just focus on watching that video and doing a good job on the quiz. Anybody have any questions or comments before I sign off? I'll say uh, when I was trying to uh, like send in the message for attendance, my phone whatever wouldn't send it still says not delivered. So I don't know if you have any way to fix that or like make note of that. Okay. Anybody else have that issue? 
I can try to send the message again. Okay, Ethan, you'll be okay. Uh, as long as I got you uh, uh, last, uh, when was it, last Wednesday? This past Wednesday, I just need to see your name, so I know you're here. Plus, you got that beer thing on your wall, so I'll remember <laughs> you anyway. So I, I All right, remember. thank you. Guys, have a great weekend. I'll see you uh, on Monday. Thank you. Hey, Professor, real quick. Yeah, I'm sorry. That, uh, that homework that's due Sunday night, um, homework yeah. two, uh, two or homework one? Uh, homework two is also due on Sunday night. Oh, that's a mistake. Okay. I was just wondering. No, I'll, thank you. I'll fix that. No, only homework one is due. Okay. Uh, what happened is I probably, when I transferred the files from, from my old canvas over, it tries to reset those times. So I'll get in and fix that. You're not, uh, it shouldn't be due. That shouldn't be due. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I kind of have something like off topic. So when people talk about like overclocking their computers, is that just uh, like ramping up the clock so that you can process data faster? Yeah, yeah, and that that uh, that that, and then I'm I'm not getting into the details of it, but yeah, that's it from a a, a big picture. Yeah, that's what that means. You just ramp up your uh, your clock speed and then you can process data faster. That's exactly right. Now uh, that can cause some issues depending on the type of processor you're using. But for the most part, yeah, what you said is correct. You just make the clock run faster and you can in theory process data faster. You can have issues though with heat because pro microprocessors, they get really, really, really hot. And when you start to overclock them, you sometimes you have to take some kind of, uh, you, have, you have to do some things with the, with the, with the, uh, the cooling system of your processor. Um, and there's some other issues that can happen, but for the most part, yeah, that's exactly what that means. Uh, I was just curious because I've heard that before. Good. I like when you guys try to relate this to things that you've heard. I think you'll find that it applies to uh, a lot of devices. And if some of you are gamers and all of that, you'll start to understand some things uh, in a different way when we use some of these terms and concepts. So good point. Anybody else have a question, comment? Uh, could you explain like how like the clocking in stuff works again, like into the register? How the how to say again now? Ask your question again. So like when you are inputting data into the register, could you explain right. how it works again? Um, I'm trying to see where to start. So. Just kind of tell me where you might have got lost. What, what was I talking about? Uh, I guess just like inputting like data into it, because I understood like after that, but I was kind of confused on like, you, I think you mentioned like clicking or something. Like what? Uh, it was like clicking like one at a time to get. The, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So let me go back to, uh, okay, I'm, I'll just try to do it on the board. Sometimes I think my pictures are nicer, but. Let me, let me, uh, so I think I started with, uh, moving data around. So the first thing you got to figure out is let's say that this is my data signal. That's data. Well, the first thing I'm going to have to figure out is, like, is this like, I don't know how many ones this is. Is that one, like, one really big one, or is this 100 ones? That looks like it might be a zero. How do I know that's not two zeros? The first thing you got to do is figure out what we call the bit time. And this is what I didn't do, the bit time. Well, the bit time is going to be determined by your clock. So if you're lucky and you have, like we had for the example today, if you have a graph, a graph that's, this is called a timing diagram. I don't think I use that. But most digital systems, when you're if you're into the design of these digital systems, you'll have these timing timing diagrams to work with. But a timing diagram is just basically let me find my marker. It shows you the data signal, and then you'll have this this clock signal. And remember, the clock is periodic, so you'll have this. 
and it'll keep going. This is periodic, so this is the clock. So when I talked about the clock clicking, I think I did use that term. What I mean is, or what I meant is, think, think about this. If my clock signal is like this, where it starts to repeat is from here, it goes up, over. I don't know if you can see that. Let me make it green. So from here, it goes up, over, like that. That's, that's what I meant by a click of the clock. So that's like here. If I drop a line down here, and it starts to repeat right there. So I drop a line down there. That's what I meant by a click of the clock. That's actually called the bit time. Okay. And so once you get that, you can just divide this up. And now you know that that's a one and a one and a one. Now what might be confusing is this waveform is carrying those three ones, but Remember, if I make a graph, and I'll, I'll do this again on Monday, but if I make a graph, time is always on the horizontal axis, and my amplitude is on the, the vertical axis. This one, because T0 is actually there, and this one happens later in time. So the, the bit I'm actually sending out first, even though it looks like that one's moving to the right, this is the one that's actually transferred first in time. So when I, when I say I'm moving a bit around, I'm actually, because of the way the waveform is drawn, and that first, if this is, the, first, the I'll call it click A, and this is click B. Click A happens before click B, which means that this one is sent down a wire or a line before that one, and so forth. So I think that's where I, where I use the term click. I don't think I went into that much detail, but does that help out, or, or is there something else? Was it somewhere else in my discussion? Yeah, so that made sense, but I think I'm like a little bit more confused, I guess, because like, I don't know, I just like wasn't expecting it to be like that, I guess. I was expecting like a click and then like you like move once you <laughs> no, get a time in, but yeah, it's a little bit different. Yeah, yeah so because, and it is kind of abstract, I'll, 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 I'll admit, it is because, um, Really, because none of this really exists. All, all a digital device can understand is the presence or absence of a voltage. Mm -hmm. And so, to, under, to, under, to understand, um, to understand that uh, I can, I can have a battery or a capacitor, something that that's going to have five volts, and say, all right, that's going to represent a one, and no volts is going to be a zero. I can take those those batteries. Like I, maybe I got. Uh, I got a, let's just do an actual battery. So let's have a five volt battery, another five volt battery. I don't have a battery here, I don't have a battery there, but I got five volts here, five volts there. Well, you can easily say, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let five volts represent a one. So in binary, this will be a one, one, zero, zero. In machine language, if I had two five volts battery, five volt batteries next to, I'm missing two here. Well, in machine language, this is, this is, this is what that represents. I can use that to represent a data point. It might represent a letter on your keyboard. I can use that to represent anything. But it does me no good to represent it and not be able to move it anywhere. I mean, if you if you if you're typing a document and you kept it in the computer, you can never print it. It's useless. You got to be able to move these zeros and ones around inside the digital device and outside the device. So that's where this idea comes in. So how do you move a one? Well, first of all, if I have a static one, that's easy. That's just Five volts, a battery, a capacitor, anything that can can have one state or another, I can use that to represent a binary one or binary zero. But moving it is a whole different ball game. So how do I move a binary one? Or how do I move a binary zero? How do I create one that's movable? Well, the way you create one that's movable is that's where the idea of a digital pulse comes in. So the pulse by itself doesn't mean anything. It's when you take all the pulses and put them together. So if I want to create that one, not like this, but one that's movable, over time what I got to do is I'll start off low at 5 volts, I mean 0 volts, so this is 0 volts. I'll go up to 5 volts. I'll stay at 5 volts for a certain amount of time, and I go back down to 0 volts. This is how I'm going to create a movable one. This is a static one in a battery or capacitor or some kind of device, but this is a movable one. This is a one that's movable. 
how do I create a zero that's movable? Well, that's going to be your, your negative going false. So I'm going to start off at 5 volts, drop down to 0 volts, stay at 0 for a certain amount of time, go back up to 5. So I'm going to use this to represent a movable 0 and this to represent a movable 1. And when I put those together in the bottom waveform down here, this is my actual data. This up here has nothing to do with 1s and zeros. This is just timing. The clock is always timing. The actual data is in these data signals down here. So when I'm talking about a movable 1, I'm taking these pulses and putting them together. And here I'm going to stay at 0 volts for a certain amount of time. I'm going to go up and stay at 5 volts for a certain amount of time and then drop back, back down to 0 to represent a transfer of a group of 1s. The problem is how many am I transferring? And that's where this bit time comes in to break that data signal up to tell you how many ones or how many zeros you're moving around. So um, I would say uh, just we'll do the we'll do the example problem on Monday, and we'll keep talking about this stuff. And uh, if you can think of a question, you can ask me in a different way on Monday. I'll I'll try to answer it to, to clear up some of the uh, confusing confusion if you're still confused. Okay, sounds good. I think I got it now. So um, I just thought of something. So like. When the so when that signal comes through and then matches up with the timing, uh, in that case, like would the shift register start with like the very end? So like A would be like, I guess like the first from the left on the shift register, and then like moving down. Okay. Well, gotcha. let me let me make sure I understand your question. So let let's do this. So here's my shift register. Let's say we got four bit register, four cells. And here's what I want to put in it. I want to put one, zero, one, zero in there. And we're going to name these bits. So this is bit A, B, C, D. So now go ahead and ask me your question. So then, uh, like, if the register is A, B, C, D, then when that signal comes through, it would have one, zero, one, zero. Yeah. So. When this, clock, when this bit time happens right here, this zero is moved over into here. So it's right here. Mm -hmm. And then after another bit time, the zero is moved over and the one is over mm -hmm. there. And after another, it just does it. In this case, it needs a four, that's where I use the term click. Four clicks, I really should say four bit times later, my whole binary number is now in this register. Like okay. that. Okay. Now, what I didn't say is, see, uh, we, we can move the bits into the register. That's called a write. So if, you, if you're writing, let's say that before I put this number in there, let's say that this had uh, it had this. It had a bunch of ones. It had that binary number in. Well, once I put this 1010 zero, one, zero into the register, what's in there before is lost. And so we're writing to the register. A, a write is what we call in computer, in computer science, it's destructive. That means that whatever was in the register before you write to it is gone. So now I have, I have that. But it's kind of misleading because let's say we have serial in, serial out. I really don't move these bits out. When I when I move them out, the original one is still there. All I do is when I read it, I make a copy of it. But you can think of it as moving out, but they're, they're really still there until you write over it. So I didn't want to get into all that because this is confusing enough, but you asked some good questions, so I just thought I'd bring that up. Oh, okay. So, yeah, okay. Uh, think about it some more, and uh, let me know Monday if you have more questions. Okay. And then, uh, so one last thing. So that is the um, serial in, and then parallel, I'm assuming, is like, or it is so parallel works a little bit differently than like clicking. It works the same way, but uh, it works like this. So let's say I have a uh, I have a serial in parallel out shift register. So what I will have mm -hmm. is I got a shift register. I got four cells. I got one line in, but I got one, two, three four lines out. Mm -hmm. So if I want to put this number in there, one, zero, one, one, 
It's going in bit by bit. So it's going to take four bit times of the clock to load this. So when I load it up at the four bit, let's say uh, the period of the clock is, uh, let's just say it's, I don't know. Let's say it's one microsecond. So let's say I give you the frequency and use that formula. You calculate the period of the clock to be one microsecond. That means the bit time is one microsecond. What mm -hmm. that means is if your clock if your clock speed is one microsecond, it can move one bit every microsecond. So it's going to take four microseconds to move this into the shift register. One microsecond for each bit. So four microseconds later, the shift register is loaded and it's going to hold it. A register is only is only job is to hold those bits, to store them. Mm -hmm. So once you load it up, let's say I want to read, I want to get those bits out. Well, because I have four lines coming out, it's not going to take four microseconds. I can, I, can, I can actually read from it in one microsecond. One click of the clock, they all appear at the same time on the outputs because I got four lines. Mm -hmm. So uh, look, at the, look at this picture again real quick. I don't want to keep you, but look at this. Look at this picture at the bottom. So what this is right here is you got a microprocessor, and over here you got memory. And what this microprocessor is doing is we're gonna here's here's the data that's moving. Here's the zeros and ones that's moving. But notice you actually have eight wires. You have eight wires connected from the microprocessor to memory. That means that it can move all these bits all those bits in one clock cycle, in one bit time. But I gotta use eight lines to do it. Whereas up here, I only got one line, so I gotta send it bit by bit. So it's gonna mm -hmm. take eight bits, it's gonna take eight, eight, eight clicks of the clock, eight bit times. Okay. So when you, go, when you go from your PC to your printer, the, the, trans, the data transfers are way slower than when your microprocessor is talking to memory. Because when, you, when you're talking from the PC to the printer, that's serial data transfer. When you're talking from the microprocessor to memory or vice versa, that's what we call parallel data transfer. All these bits move at one time because they each have their own wire they can use to move across. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank yeah. you. That was a good question. And like I said, yeah, no uh, I will see you on Monday. All right. Bye-bye. Have, Have a good weekend. See you. You too. Thank you.